Disruptors, curious minds, CEOs, professionals, founders, book lovers. It's that time of week again. I'm Mark, this is Jeremy, and this is the Thinking on Paper Book Club, where each week we explore the insight, strategy, frameworks and magic of books we think could change your life, but I'll certainly change our lives at least, and that's why we're doing it. Uh, part five of Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish. And we're in the death zone. If this was Mount Everest, we are climbing into the death zone, literally and figuratively, aren't we, Jeremy, today? That's a fact. That's a fact. We've come to the end of our journey. We've looked at the weather. We've made, we checked oxygen levels and we've made the decision to, uh, to summit today. So, uh, Memento Mori. That's yeah, that's intense, right? That's, that's intense. I definitely want to, I definitely want to chat about that because it, it puts you in an interesting mindset, but let's, let's start, let's start off. So the, the end of the book, everything's kind of threading together. The one piece of this chapter that like, you know, that rattled my feathers in a, in a good way is think about this collection of words, turn future hindsight into current foresight. Yeah, like it. I wrote that down. It's a good one. That's pretty big. Like we could spend we could spend 20 minutes talking about that, right? Because we're all we're you know, we all think making quick decisions makes us more valuable, right? And certain decisions can be made quickly, but certain decisions require a little bit more time and effort, right? But like instead of looking back on the should they call it in the I don't know if they have this phrase uh where where you are, but it's like the shoulda, woulda, coulda. Should have, would have, could have, should have, would have, could have. Last words of a fool to quote uh, that singer. I can't remember her name. Yeah. Could have, should have, yeah. would have. Yeah. Shania then, Twain. All right. <laughs> right. So, so that was super interesting. And then another piece that I pulled out of this, and he hinted on it a little bit in the last chapter, but again, came back to it in this chapter that is so aligned with with what I'm doing with Right to Know You, like I was doing backflips as I read it. So think about not just knowing what you want, but to know what is worth wanting. Like, holy moly, right? Like, do we even give ourselves the time and, and energy to think about that? Do you? For, for Renesis, well, yeah. So I'm going to read, and the irony of this is not lost on me that the part I'm going to read is actually written by AI or with the help of AI, according to Shane Parrish, like the one phrase in the whole book that was, right. he helped use. Where I, that's At least what he gave a nod read. to it. Yeah. And I think the whole book has been about how to think, clear thinking, the strategies you can employ, the decision tree, how to make good decisions, how to make wise decisions, how to come to the best choices. But, and it's a big but, isn't it, Jeremy? Decisions that bring immediate results, like closing a sale or filling a vacancy, may be effective, but they don't necessarily lead to the things that truly matter in life, like trust, love, health. Good decisions, on the other hand, align with your long-term goals and values and ultimately bring you the satisfaction and fulfilment that you truly desire in business, relationships and life. Effective decisions get you the first outcome, while good ones get you the ultimate outcome. Yeah, no, it's this is this is this is big stuff, man. And it's big yeah. stuff that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people don't give and, and this is I said this earlier, give themselves the 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 time, the grace, the space to, to think about this stuff. But, you know, going back to something that I that I do in my life, you know, I coach. We've talked about this. I coach lacrosse, high school lacrosse, youth lacrosse. And in one of my pregame speeches uh, a week ago, I talked about what he refers to as like the accumulation of of tiny moments that didn't seem to matter at the time, right? So I, I, I phrase that in a way that, you know, hey guys, if you look at this game, not as, hey, we're going into this thing and then there's one outcome or another outcome. There are actually thousands of tiny moments in this game that you can choose to have a good effect on or a negative effect on. And the accumulation of those moments will deliver us into something that, that, is, a, that is a final outcome. Um, so I, I'm a big believer in that. And did like, you win the game? With we that? didn't. We we've been struggling. We've been struggling <laughs> a bit this season. I have. All right. So not to go too deep into this, but I have roughly like 60 percent of the players on my junior varsity team are brand new to the sport. Literally, they we just gave them sticks like three months ago. So I think they've they've done a tremendous job. But where we are in the region we play, and everyone's been playing together since they were five. So it's like 
it's a bit of a, a bit of a interesting dynamic. But no, going back, your to- team talks must be great. Like they can't win a game of lacrosse, but they can recite Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. At That's a fact. No, no, no. We're 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 teaching them to be good humans through the game of lacrosse. Uh, so I think that's that's a big piece. But um, yeah, you mentioned uh, phrenesis, phrenesis, phrenesis. Yeah, however you want to pronounce it, phrenesis. The, I've never the, heard of that before. No, the wisdom of knowing how to order your life to achieve the best results. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it. It's, it's Greek, all Greek to me. It's an important part of this whole chapter is really about taking stock of your life, imagining your past, what you want to leave behind, the memories, the relationships, the work, the your, your principles, your legacy. And he gets deep. And this forensis, forensis, however you want to pronounce it, if we have some Greek fans, please tell us how you really pronounce it, of knowing. And so, Jeremy, how do you know how to order your life to achieve the best results? I tell you what, this, I, I don't think I do. I don't think I do like fully, right? But I think what I do, and again, I'm always speaking from the stuff that I do outside of what we do is in the show, this, this Right to Know You program. Like part of that is me writing every day to understand what's going on in my head, right? I can turn my thoughts into these objects. And now that I see them as objects, they're not me. So they're separated. They're decoupled from these defaults that, that he talks about the ego default, the inertia default, the emotional default, the, uh, what was the other one? Inertia. Yeah. 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 All, all of those different defaults. So I separate those and now I can organize those pieces and parts, which essentially are, who I am, what I want to do, what I haven't done, what I don't want to do, uh, who I want to work with, why I want to work with them, who I don't want to work with, right? So I have the pieces, but I think I think ordering those is the challenge, right? Like, I don't know that I have like a map that I can go, oh, well, here's where I want to go. Here's where I am now. And if I follow this, I'll get there. But I I know the process that I'm in right now is helping me get there but i don't i think it's i think it's a, a process with everything i mean what do you think do you how do you how do you respond to that because you're pretty you're 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 a you're a learned man right like you're a writer you're a reader you're a thinker like do you know this order like or a little piece of this order like no I'm fucking clueless i haven't really <laughs> like i haven't got a clue and i and um i this chat this is one of those chapters where as I was reading it, I was thinking, yeah, I know that. Oh, I know that. I know that. Uh, yeah, I know that. Why don't I bloody do it? <laughs> Is it one of those things where, you know, you tell, you can tell a teenager until you're blue in the face to do this, this and this, and they're, they're just going to make their own mistakes and they're not going to realise. And it doesn't matter what you say. You can give them some skills to maybe cope with the consequences of it, but, you know, they're going to do it. And I wonder if this is just a journey that most of us don't get to until the end. And then we realize, that, I mean, he, at one point he speaks about the research of, um, what was the, what was the guy's name? Um, Pelham or something. He interviewed lots of old people to get the wisdom of life and how you can adapt these strategies to live your best life. And he includes the following advice from people over the age of 80, I think. Say things now to people you care about, whether it's expressing gratitude, asking forgiveness or getting information. Spend the maximum amount of time with your children. Save a daily pleasures instead of waiting for big ticket items to make you happy. Work in a job you love. Choose your mate carefully. Don't rush in. I think I am aware of life happens in the gaps. It's those idle moments that make up life. And I am becoming more aware of that. And if that's living in the moment, then... I'm getting better at that. And I think that is the one strategy that I'm kind of getting better at from, from, from this liver forensis strategy. Yeah, I think, I think it is those like, I keep going back to it. I'm reading it on the notes that I read. The, hum- the accumulation of tiny moments that didn't seem to matter at the time. I think um, being able to be aware of those tiny moments, not in a... Not in a way where you're 
like, hey, is this tiny moment good or is it bad? Or is it is it feeding where I want to go? Because there has to be the beauty of those tiny moments is the fact that you're all in on those tiny moments. You're not thinking about them. So you can't watch something and do something at the same time, right? Necessarily. You can be in something or you can not be in something, right? And for a tiny moment to have that magic, you have to be in it and you have to not be judging it. But after a while, you can kind of look back and go, man, that was a really cool moment. How do I find more ways to do that? And, you know, this week, so my kids are on spring break. Um, my spring wife, break. I know. Ah! So my, my wife took uh, my sophomore in high school, my oldest boy, uh, down to a place in Florida where like a lot of the a lot of the folks this age and in this area go to a lot of the debauchery unfolds that's that's right so she's down there with a bunch of other moms and all of his friends and all of that so they're so they're doing that so i've got my two youngest boys here um and uh, uh, uh seventh grader and fourth grader so trying to do fun little things and and cut out you know from work uh, to do that but what we did the other night i cooked it we cooked a steak and sat down at like the big dinner table and um we picked out I, I like when we do dinners like that i have a record collection so i'm like i tell one of them to go pick out a record to listen to during dinner he uh picks out like a stan gets record i was like yo nice work and we're just sitting there <laughs> listen to like Brazilian jazz and eating steak and just having a freaking blast. And I'm like, man, this, this is what it's about. Like, it's not about like, man, I, I wish I, I wish I had, uh, you know, uh, this kind of car. Or I, you know, I wish I didn't wear the same sweatshirt every day. Like, you know, th those kind of things it's, it's an alignment of, um, what is important versus what is urgent. And that's something I think that I think about a lot. He doesn't mention in this book, but this chapter got me thinking about urgent versus important. And I would ask you, what do you think the difference is between urgent and important? Well, they're, they're not comparable, are they? Urgent and important. So, I mean, is, is anything urgent really important? I mean, if I, what I think is urgent now in in five years isn't going to be important. It probably in two weeks isn't going to be important. Probably tomorrow, most of it I, I think will be urgent, won't be important tomorrow. Whereas w wanting what matters is important. That doesn't make any sense. But I've taken out two sentences from this, from this part. Want what matters and comparison is the thief of joy. And To answer your question, I have no idea. I, like, I, I can't... What is the difference between urgent and important? So the way, I, the way I think about it is like, there's urgency like, oh my God, you know, one of my friends got injured. I have to help him. There's an urgency to, to that, the immediacy. But like urgency can be cast upon us by other people, right? right and, okay. you know, kind of dropping something in your lap that is, you know, that you kind of have to get done, but you know, how does it align with something that's important to you? So we talked about the rules of this, uh, you know, automatic rules going back like two or three chapters that, you know, you get someone, you know, calling you immediately and say, Hey, I have, I have to jump on the phone right this second, Mark, we need to talk right this second because of this and because of that. And, and it's in the middle of your time that you write in the morning and you're protecting that time. And, um, then there's a decision between urgency cast upon you and importance that comes from within and that, uh, that lets you work on the things that matter, but also, Hey, I'm not, here's the funny thing. You can't, we can't get to the point where we're, I'm not saying cast away all obligations, right? Because if we <laughs> cast away all obligations, you know, we don't have an internet connection, you know, we haven't eaten today, so we can't do the show. Like we don't have a roof over our heads. Like I'm not saying cast away all, all of our obligations, but I think there's a lens that you can look through that has this urgent, important lens and leaning on some of your automatic rules to be able to manage your time and energy, I think is a, is a cool thing to think about. That is a cool thing to think about. I'm going to think about it some more. Um, one of the things I like about part five of Clear Thinking and the book in general is that I didn't think at any point 
oh this is this is just cliched nonsense like uh, this is this is this is obviously cliched it's not interesting and, he, and even though he speaks about very well documented life paths um but he, it doesn't come across as cliched it comes across as real um he he speaks at one point about Ebenezer Scrooge and how Ebenezer got a se- second roll of the, the whole point of a Christmas carol is that Ebenezer got a second roll of the dice and we don't get a second roll of the dice and Ebenezer Scrooge did and he manages to like connect Ebenezer Scrooge to like deciding what matters in your life with the decisions that you make and like I found it very non-cliched yeah the Ebenezer Scrooge thing is always a good um always a good reference to you know are you operating from a point of what what society has convinced you are the things that matter versus like the true things that matter. Right. So I think he references it as society's scoreboard, right? So Scrooge was playing a game that was managed by society's scoreboard. So like what these defaults tell you to do. And even if you win, because he was winning technically, like he was, he was, you know, making a bunch of money at the expense of all the other things, but that's what, Hey, go get money. It's money. It's money. It's money. But then you have you have the money, but you don't have all the other stuff that makes life worth me worth living. Right. So it leaves you unfulfilled because you're not writing the rules of the game like society and the defaults wrote the rules for Scrooge. We need to think about writing rules for a game that the outcome matters to us. Like it. What do you think about, so it got me thinking, uh, you know, on the happiness side of the fence, right? So happiness is not a passive condition dependent on external events was, was a quote in there. It got me thinking of two things. Number one, there's a social media handle called the new happy. Um, I don't know if you've ever run across it. Stephanie Harrison, I think is the, the person that founded it, but she's got these brilliant graphics that are like great daily reminders of like the important things in life. And she's done really, really well. So if you want to listeners, if you want to check that out, the new happy is a great place to get these like reminders of what is important or to help you think about, you know, what is, what is important. Do you have any examples to hand there that she's written? Oh man, there, there are so many. Um, I would just suggest go, go check out the handle. Um, But it also pointed to the idea of happiness versus joy. And um, Matthew McConaughey, of all people, has an amazing video out there that explains the difference between happiness and joy. And happiness is kind of dependent on something. It's uh, what he calls, I think in this, he references something called happy when people. So, hey, Mark, I'll be happy when uh, I get this new promotion. Hey, Mark, I'll be happy when I can finally buy that Tesla. Hey, Mark, I'll be happy when I can finally get to the beach and retire, right? Um, and these are like societal things, right? Based on defaults and all of the things that that feed us and motivate us. But, you know, joy is, is kind of points more to the accumulation of those tiny moments. Joy is felt in those tiny moments. Joy is felt in the dinner I had with my two boys when we were listening to Stan Getz and we were eating steak and just that is joy right but happiness is dependent kind of so i don't know what how do you think about that how do you how do you think about happiness i I don't think i can add anything to what you've just said to to make it sound any better than you just described it so i I like the idea of happiness being a a decision so if you extrapolate far enough you can choose to be happy you can choose to not be happy i don't know how much that takes into account physiological hormonal imbalances but i th- i like that idea i also like that idea that you just said about i'm happy when and i will try to be a conscious of when i say or when i think i'll be happy when because i definitely do that so i've got a question i'll be you. happy when the sun comes out and i can go to the beach i'll be happy when i get paid so i can do i'll be happy with yeah Yep. No, hundred percent. So, all right. I got a question for you. Cause I, I've been talking a lot. I want to hear from you on this. So here's our thought experiment that he throws out, you know, this, uh, this idea of memento mori, right? 
So if this was the final year of your life, not to get too dark, but just to get real, this was the final year of your life, would you be living the same way you are living today? Uh, that's not what the thought experiment that I thought you were going to ask me was. Uh, no, I wouldn't be living the same way as I am today, which is a really bad answer. So, no, I wouldn't. What what would be the what would be the number one thing you would change? Well, judging by the conversation we've just had, I would probably try to focus on and want what matters, not chasing external uh, vindication, hmm. acceptance. I would do that. Um, I on, on the momentum away. I I, you, I thought you were going to ask. You know, like if you were on your your bench and the Grim Reaper was coming for you, what would you? want to look back on and have accomplished and i was going to say i'm not going to tell you because i know that publicly announcing your goals makes you less um likely of achieving them um it's the motivation killer never tell anybody what your plan is if, if you go i'm going to go run a marathon don't tell people because you, you're completing it in your head and it'll make it more difficult so don't do that that's think, interesting I, i'm gonna hold your thought real quick because i'll push back on that because i think when you then. publicly announce something you actually are have to commit to it because you've put it out in the air and then the actual you you're using your defaults to your advantage because you don't want to you don't want to um not be disgraced publicly, but if you don't do the thing, then you're like, oh, well, he didn't do the thing, right? I don't know. I think that I think that could actually help with the defaults. Anyway, continue. Check out some research from NYU by a guy called Peter Golwitzer, because um, there has been some research on this, and if obviously there's been research against it as well. But yeah, if by publicly announcing it, you you kind of rest on your laurels. I mean, it, obviously, it probably depends on what you're announcing and how capable you are of achieving what you announced. I mean, me saying I'm going to run 10 kilometers tomorrow is not the same as me saying I'm going to run an ultra marathon because one I can probably do, the other I definitely can't. So, you know, yeah, maybe there's a bit yeah. of um, difference in there. I was going to say that if we're going to play this game of, of how Seneca said, let us prepare our minds if we'd come to the end of our life. Um, I'd focus on the physicality. I want to be doing things at 80 that I'm doing now. So I would focus more on my physical health that when i'm 70 80 i'm capable of feats of physical endurance i want to go i want to go run up mountains with my kids kids so i would do that so that would be a thing you seem like a pretty healthy dude though yeah I, you seem I, like I could be, yeah you seem like you're doing doing that kind of stuff right yeah but i'm i'm still i'm i'm not i'm only 44 so got to keep it going for another whipper 40 snapper. years you're a whippersnapper <laughs> man um what about you so I think to me, it points back to these these rules that I put in place, these almost guiding principles. Um, I think I shared some of them. You know, number one is, you know, provide stability and opportunity for my family. Right. So that that includes presence, not presence with like gifts, but like my presence. Right. Uh, yeah. It includes the financial support. Right. So the financial piece of the puzzle is there to make sure they have, you know, have what they need. Um, then another rule is, you know, build cool shit with great people, right? Build cool shit with amazing people. It's an example of like what we're doing right here. Like I'm doing that because we're like-minded and we're building what I think is pretty cool. Right. So, it, it, and, and another thing, you know, find ways to teach is another one, right? Be driven by my curiosity is another one. Um, you know, keep smiling is another one. That's something my dad always says to me, right? You know, hey, you'll, he'll hang up the phone and be like, hey, keep smiling, right? Okay, cool. That's great. Am I doing those things? Is a large percentage of my day, can I, can I point to some of those rules, some of those automatic rules, some of those guiding principles? And if I can, then it's, it's a, it's a pretty good day. It's a pretty good week. It's a pretty good year. It's a pretty good life. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think, I mean, obviously there's some things that, that, that I would want that, you know, I would look back and, and, and want to have done a little differently, but I think if I'm hitting those buckets, i I genuinely feel pretty good about what I've been doing. You've got to have some regrets. I always say if, if, if somebody says I regret nothing, it just demonstrates a lack of imagination. 
Interesting. So he talks about regret, right? So where is this? Um, hold on. Regret. Let's see. Regret is the result of defaults ending up in the driver's seat, right? So if your driver's seat, if your defaults are driving the ship, right? If one of those four defaults is driving the ship, the destination will likely be regret. I thought that was pretty interesting. I mean, regret, sure. I mean, you know, sure. There, there are definitely, definitely some regrets. Like not to, not to go, not to go too dark, but I had like a pretty good friend of mine from high school, like recently pass away, like uh, a week or so ago. And, you know, kind of went to the service and, and all of that. And I look back and we hadn't been in touch in quite a long time, like quite a long time. And, and I think I would look back and say, man, well, I wish I would have treated him a little better. I wish I would have um, reached out and stayed in touch. Right. So there, there are always things like that, that I could look back at, but you don't want to be too in too much in the regret pile though. I think. And sorry about your friend. Was I appreciate it. was the service just full of people like you thinking the same thing? What do you mean? Well, was it was it full of people who had the same? I wish I'd, I wish I'd spent more time talking to this guy. I wish I'd done this. I'd, I, I probably yes. This the service was actually great. It was kind of a, a celebration of the dude that like he was a he was a connector. He was like uh, a joyful person. He was uh, you know always brought like the light into um, places that needed it. Right. So it was like largely a celebration of that. Um, I don't know. I, I hadn't gone too deep uh, with some of the other people in that. Um, but, you know, maybe maybe because there are some other people that maybe hadn't been in touch in a while. One what matters. Comparison is the thief of joy. Live every day. As if it was your last. I know that's easy to say. It's not easy to do. That Clear is thinking fact. by Shane Parrish might help you. I would add one. I would add one piece to that puzzle, and I, that was a great way to to wrap this up, Mark. But uh, one one piece of that puzzle is, you know, uh, knowing what is worth wanting. Like know what is worth wanting. That takes a little bit a little bit more work, a little bit more introspection, right? To mm -hmm. to to figure that out. And and kind of a last takeaway that I had from clear thinking is, you know, this sentence, a little paraphrase of what he wrote is, you know, designing systems when you when you're at your best to use when you are at your worst. And it goes back to those automatic rules, right? If if that's the rule, that's the system. That's my operating system. Just like those things I talked about are my operating system, the stability and opportunity, build cool shit with amazing people like that's an operating system. And, you know, clear thinking can help you set up an operating system. So. That was good, man. I enjoyed the book. I enjoyed uh, unpacking it with you. We look forward to announcing the next one very, yes. very soon. Um, stay tuned on that. Don't, and don't forget the last two book clubs, The Nexus. You can check that out on YouTube and The Design of Everyday Things. You can check that out on YouTube and Thinking on Paper.xyz. Catch up. They're awesome books. We, we talk about, we talk about, I think we spend about eight hours on the nexus that's how good that book is so check it out thinking on paper xyz like share follow all that stuff be curious um, stay disruptive keep thinking on paper